Greetings from Mesa View United Methodist Church of Albuquerque, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We are located at the corner of Taylor Ranch and Montana Road, and we invite you to join us for worship every Sunday. Our traditional service is at 8.30 a.m., and our contemporary worship is at 11 a.m. More information may be found at our website, mesaviewumc.com. To honor all copyright restrictions, we have removed some audio and video footage from this message. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's Holy Word. And we follow with the reading of the Old Testament from Ecclesiastes, chapters 3, verses 1 to 8. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. Sometimes you just have one of those worship services. It looks like today is going to be one of those, so bear with us. Yeah, that's right, we're all human. Forgiveness is divine. <coughs> we continue today in our sermon series in uh, Gospel and Pixar, looking at the movie Inside Out, another Pixar film in which the lead character is female, and really four of the main characters in this film are women. The main lead is Riley, an 11-year-old girl who has recently moved from Minnesota to San Francisco where her father is beginning a, a new job. And while the movie's about Riley and her experiences in this move, it's a lot more about what's going on in Riley's mind, of how her emotions are working together to lead her in what she does and lead all the other characters as well. Although we have different emotions, for simplicity's sake, Pixar limited it to five. There is Joy, who is designed to look like a star. Sadness, who is designed to look like a teardrop and is blue. Disgust, who looks like broccoli. Fear, who is tall and thin, supposed to look like a nerve. And then there's my personal favorite, Anger, who is designed to look like a brick. I only show that because that's one of my favorite scenes. I love <laughs> film. So these emotions live and work in the central complex. Hold on. Hit pause. Hit pause. There we go. Like I said, this is one of those services. What I always tell wedding couples is, no matter what happens during the service, because something nearly always goes wrong in a wedding, no matter what happens, that's how we planned it. And then there are those services where you say, no, there's just no way we could have planned all of that. So. so these emotions work together in Riley's head and her parents' head in the central complex known as the headquarters, pun intended, and they control what's going on in everyone's lives. So rather than trying to explain how they interact to, get to you, I'm going to show that clip that we just saw very brief moments of. So as it turns out, Riley is miserable with the move. The moving truck has not arrived with any of their stuff. Their dad's job is not going well. And to make matters worse is that joy and sadness are sort of battling it out. And so as Riley has an experience, the memory comes into the control center, and it's coded by the feeling, the emotion that it's tagged to. So yellow for joy, red for anger, green for disgust, and then all of the balls get moved into long-term memory at night when Riley goes to sleep. But as it turns out that the emotions, once they come into the mind, can be changed if one of the other emotions touches it. So if it's an emotion that had been joy and sadness touches it, 
it turns to blue and it becomes a, 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 mo a memory of sadness. So when sadness begins touching these memories, it makes Joy very upset, and she seeks to try and control sadness to keep her locked in her own uh, lone space. At one point, she draws a circle on the floor and tells sadness to stay in that space so she can't do any more damage. But what Joy wants to happen is for none of the other emotions really to be involved, especially for sadness to be there. And so in one of their battles together, joy and sadness get sucked up into the tube, into the brain where the long-term memories are located, leaving only <coughs> anger, disgust, and fear in control, which is what was just part of that scene there. And so anger then says, everything's a total disaster. All of our good memories were back in Minnesota. Why don't we go back there to create good memories again and so they plant this idea in Riley's mind for her to run away and to jump on a bus to go back to Minnesota while Joy and Sadness are desperately trying to get back to headquarters. Now, like all Pixar films, there are tons of different things that we could talk about in this film, one of them, again, being this concept of identity. But today we're going to talk about those roles of Joy and Sadness in our lives and how we're supposed to view them and feel and deal with them. I think that I could say that most of us would rather be joyful than we would to be sad. That's just where we prefer to be. But yet, joy and sadness are both part of our lives. And yet there are some people who would try and tell us that we should try and avoid sadness as much as possible. Put on that happy face, right? We hear that sometimes. Don't be sad. Certainly don't let that sadness be shown to anyone else. And so this is represented in the film not just by Joy and her desire to push everyone else aside, but even by Riley's mother. Now her mom is trying to do what she thinks is best, but at the same time does it and shuts down what Riley wants to be feeling. This is part of that don't worry, be happy movement. Remember that? Just put everything else aside. Just be happy. No matter what's going on, be happy. We certainly hear that a lot in church. In Philippians, we're told to find our, our joy or to rejoice in the Lord at all times. Or to put it another way, Francis de Sales, a 17th century bishop of Geneva, said, I cannot understand why those who have given themselves up to God and his goodness are not always cheerful. For what possible happiness can equal to that? No accidents or imperfections which may happen ought to have the power to trouble them or to hinder their looking upward. Now we're not talking about letting go of God during tough times. We're talking about hanging on to God regardless of what's going on in our, our lives. But it's this idea that you always have to be joyful. Always have to be putting that face out to the world, no matter what is happening to us, if that's what we should be expressing. Is that possible? Is it even good for us to be doing that? Is it desirable? That's certainly what joy and others would have us think, but there are several problems. The first is I can't actually figure out how you actually do that in real life. You know, even if 90% of the time you're just thrilled with life, there's that 10%. How do you overcome that little bit? The second problem is that even if we could figure out how to be joyful at all times, is that a healthy thing for us to do? Does it match who we are or who we are called to be? Now, there are certainly some health benefits to being happy, to being joyful, even if you fake it. So you can smile because you're joyful, or you could be really depressed and start to smile, faking it, and your brain will respond exactly the same way. You could even just pull up your lips into a smile, <laughs> and your brain will start releasing the endorphins it would as if you were happy. So there are positive impacts from being happy in our lives. Now it's been hypothesized, therefore, that if smiling is good for us, even when we don't mean to be smiling, that if we focus on our negative emotions, that they therefore must be bad for us, that they do bad things 
to us. That bring, being angry would only lead to more negativity. And there's some evidence to back up that belief. That we should work on acting as if we are happy and our body will therefore respond to that. But in another experiment, scientists asked participants to stick their arm into a bucket of ice cold water. Now, if you've ever done that, it doesn't do any permanent damage to you, but it hurts a lot. And so what they wanted to study was two different groups. One group was allowed to say they could be quiet if they wanted to, or if they needed to talk, they could use a word that would be used to describe a table. And the other group was allowed to cuss like a sailor. <laughs> now, the original hypothesis was that those who were cursing would be expressing their pain and therefore would make them more heightened to the sense of pain, and they would not be able to hold their arm in the water as long as those who weren't focusing on their pain in the words they were expressing. But what they found was the exact opposites. That the cussing, giving voice to their complaints, actually allowed them to keep their arm in the water for longer. That by voicing the pain that they were experiencing, they could endure it longer than those who weren't doing the same thing. We see this in Scripture. Of course, a lot of the psalms are psalms of thanksgiving and joy, but a lot of them are also cries of lament, cries of complaint to God. Out of the deep have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Now, the other problem is we often talk about positive and negative emotions. But there's no such thing. They're just emotions. We give meaning to our emotions of whether they are positive or negative. And when we say that there's only the good ones are joy or happiness and all the others are all negative, we miss part of who we are. But we also miss part of who we are as being created in the image of God. So we should look at Scripture. Who does God? Who has God presented to us that we find in the Bible? Does God express anger? Yeah. Does God express sorrow? Yeah. Does God express joy? Yeah. Does God express disgust? Yeah. The only one that's really not there is fear. But we hear a lot about fear because God says, "Fear not." So that is that God is not just one emotion. We see the full range of emotion expressed in God. We saw it all expressed in Jesus as well. So it's not a sin to be sad. And it's not a sin to be angry. And it's not a sin to be fearful. It's not a sin to be disgusted. It's not a sin to be joyful. All of those things could lead to sin. They can lead to broken relationships depending on what we do with them. But in and of themselves, they are not sins. And that's what joy has to ultimately come to understand as well. That instead of trying to contain and control sadness, to keep her pushed over to the side and out of Riley's life, that she has to come to understand the important role that sadness plays as one of the emotions in Riley's life. And she begins to see this when she sits, sadness sits down with Bing Bong, who was Riley's imaginary play friend when she was three years old. And Bing Bong's rocket ship has just been pushed into the place where the memories go to die. Have you ever been feeling miserable and you had somebody come up to you who thought that it was their job to try and cheer you up? <laughs> Isn't that totally annoying? <laughs> I mean, there are times in which that is necessary to help somebody by trying to cheer them up. But most of the time, it's to say it's okay to feel what you're feeling and just be present for them. Because one of the things about sadness is it can be extremely isolating. We think that we're the only one who's mourning, we're the only one who's feeling these emotions. And they get stuck and they can't move on, but simply by being present and saying, you're not alone. And it's okay to feel what you're feeling. It can be the impetus, allow them to move on out of that sing so the season of their lives. And that's what Bing Bong will eventually do for Joy when 
She hits a moment of despair in her search to get back home. And she begins crying, thinking that everything is lost, that Riley is lost to her. But what we turn out is that although joy represents joy in this story, as she goes through this journey, she actually experiences all of the emotions. She expresses anger at what sadness does, especially sadness's obstinacy. She expresses disgust towards Riley's new imaginary boyfriend. She expresses fear when they encounter Jangles the Clown. And finally, sadness when she thinks all is lost. That is, even in her joyfulness, joy has anger and sadness and disgust and fear as part of her life. And when she finally comes to understand how that works, is that she and sadness end up having one of the same favorite memories. Both sadness and joy remember the same thing and remember how important it was to Riley, although they remember it in different ways. What joy comes to understand, she remembers it just from the celebration, and sadness remembers it just from missing the game-winning shots. Is it for Riley to be healthy and happy, she has to have that full range of emotion. She has to experience all of those things. That there's not a, a hard divide between what makes us happy and what makes us sad, what makes us fearful or angry or disgusted. The joy has, to an extent, somewhat understood anger and disgust and fear, but she's never understood sadness because, in some ways, it's the opposite of who she is. She's never understood sadness's place in Riley's life. And yet sadness has always been a part of her and of Riley. Because, as it turns out, all of the characters are all the same color, except for Joy. And Joy, her hair is exactly the same as sadness's is. It's blue. But sadness is a part of who Joy is. That to experience joy, you have to know what sadness is like. And to know what sadness is like, you have to have experienced joy. The joy comes to realize that she can't talk rightly out of her sadness. She can't make smiley faces or tickle her, do whatever it might need to be. And she can't outjoy everyone else to make Riley happy. She has to allow Riley to experience her whole life. And so as Riley has boarded the bus by herself to run away and go back to Minnesota, Joy and Sadness finally make it back to headquarters, and everyone looks to Joy and says, Joy, you have to solve this problem. But Joy says, it can't be me. And with that, Riley is back. And what happens with this insight is that now Riley's memories are no longer just one color. Now they're a spectrum of colors as she experiences them in her life. The fear and joy can go together. And anger and sadness can go together. And joy and sadness can go together. We are not called to fake it until we make it as purveyors of happiness would have us believe. We are called to experience and to live all of our emotions. We are called to live into the image of God who made us have all of these emotions. And they all have positive and they all have negative connotations. While we may seek to experience joy in God and all that we do, we never should make that come to believe that we therefore have to be joyful in everything that we do. Because there is a time to laugh and a time to cry. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to reap and a time to sow. There is a season for everything. And a time for every purpose under heaven. I pray that you will be so, my brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>